Many people are afraid of the end of the world, especially some of the elite rich who have been buying up bunkers in a specific island, and that island is New Zealand. Now, you might say, why New Zealand? Well, if you look at the map on your screen, you'll see that New Zealand is pretty far away from the rest of the countries. It's right there in the middle of the ocean, and it's 2,500 miles from Australia. Its mountains are 2,000 feet above sea level, and a funny fact, it has six times the population of sheep than actual residents. The politicians, they ride their bikes to their office, and they're not at odds or enemies of any other nation. Also, if you think about a nuclear target, uh, New Zealand is not on that list of a primary target. So many uh, millionaires, billionaires, have been buying bunkers and shipping them actually to the island of New Zealand and building these bunkers. And these bunkers can be pretty elaborate. They actually build them. Uh, they, set, they ship them over from Texas or other countries. And then uh, they build them at nighttime when the residents are sleeping. By the time they're done, the residents don't even know it's there. And the only way to find this location is through a specific GPS coordinates. It's actually been quoted from Bloomberg and the New York Times back in 2018 that there was a conversation that a few of the elite were having on a, one of their golf streams about the end times. And one of them was saying that he had a motorcycle ready and that he had a bag of guns and supplies ready to go in a large bag that he could just put on his motorcycle and that he could ride his motorcycle with his guns and, and supplies uh, through the traffic and get to a destination where his plane was waiting for him. That plane would take off and fly to Arizona and where there was a specific golf stream waiting for them just to fly them out to their bunker. Isn't that pretty crazy? Now, you and I might not be able to afford a bunker in New Zealand, but is it actually necessary in the first place? Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share your word today. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, that you guide me and lead me by your righteous right hand to share your word today. And I pray that the people might be blessed, that we might be convicted of sin and transformed by your righteousness. Give us hope and encouragement in these times that we're living in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, and we're going to look at verses 3 and on. Matthew 24, verse 3. And the disciples have a question for Jesus. And the question is this. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? They were, they were asking him about the temple being destroyed in Jerusalem. But they were also wanting to know this. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they want to know what the end will be like. Well, Jesus doesn't waste any time. He answers their question in the next few verses. Notice Jesus' question, the question that we want to know too. When will the end of the world be? Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for these things must come to pass. But the end, what does it say? Is not yet. So there's going to be people deceiving people that this is the Christ. You're going to hear wars and rumors of wars. And he says, these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be, notice what it says, famines, pestilences, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 
and there will be a famine, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And it says, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. So have you seen famines? Have you seen pestilences? Have you seen earthquakes? If you were to take, I don't have it here with me, but if you were to look at graphs and charts of historical famines and pestilences and earthquakes, what you're going to see is they keep getting worse and greater in number and closer to each other. And it says these, in verse 8, all these are the beginning of what? Sorrows. What does that mean, all these are the beginning of sorrows? Well, if you look at the New American Standard Version Bible, it actually says it more correct. It says, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. So the earthquakes, the famines, the pestilences, the wars, the false uh, prophecy, false Christs that are claiming to be Christ, are not, not uh, the end, but the beginning of birth pangs. Actually, I want to share with you the Greek, in, the Greek here. Uh, the Greek is arche odinon. Arche odinon. Arche means the beginning, and odinon means birth pangs. So going back to our text, they're beginning of birth pangs. So doing some research on this, I actually found out that, um, you know, a woman can, going into labor can be quite a process, a long process, many hours. And the contractions, uh, they get closer to, uh, closer to each other, and it becomes a little bit more painful uh, for the woman. Um, and it gets worse and worse until the baby's born. And um, that's what, this is, what Jesus is saying. These things are going to be like birth pangs. Basically, the famines, the pestilence, the earthquakes, they're going to be closer together. They're going to be greater. Um, things are going to get worse. And so there's going to be a, um, a problem, and then the problem's going to go away. And there's going to be a greater problem, and the problem's going to go away. And there's going to be even a greater problem, and the problem's going to go away. You can see the logic behind that. So those that are fearing of more disasters to come, that is a true statement. There are more to come. But things will get better, and then they'll get worse. Things will get better, and they'll get worse. Just like a woman giving birth. When she is pushing, it hurts, and then she um, takes a breath, and then she pushes again, and this continues on until the baby's born. All these are the beginning of sorrows, it says. Then moving on, it says, Then they will deliver you up into tribulation and kill you. And, will be, and you will be hated by all the nations for ni- my namesake. Now he's talking specifically about his disciples, but also people during the end time. And, the, and many will be offended of you, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. Again, more false prophets. And because of lawlessness, now I want you to understand exactly what lawlessness is here. It's not talking about lawlessness of the government. It's talking about lawlessness of God's law, his Ten Commandments, people disobeying the Ten Commandments. So stealing, lying, committing adultery, um, blaspheming God's name, and the list goes on. It says, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Are people becoming more selfish in today's world? Absolutely. Self-centered? Yes. But he who endures, finally, finally, the hope comes, verse 13. But he who endures to the end, what's it say there? Shall be saved. He who endures, he who presses on, he who goes through these and continues to trust and follow Jesus, if he does this, if she does this, and continues in this, they shall be saved. And this gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. So, you know, it's kind of funny because the, I mean, kind of sad. I'll put it that way. It's not funny. It's sad. That um, many people portray the end of the world as a terrible thing. Like uh, you, you see movies of the, like the Armageddon, uh, the end of the world kind of stuff. And uh, people are running, it's chaos, and 
people are scared, and it's, it's going to be bad. There's no doubt about that. But it's bad for a specific group of people. What do I mean by that? Notice what it says. Immediately after the tribulation, this is Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes, notice what it says, all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So the people of the world, it says they'll be mourning to see the second coming of Jesus Christ. Why would they be mourning? Well, the answer is quite simple because they haven't been following him in the first place. And so now that he's finally come, that means judgment has come as well for them. Destruction. So yes, that's why they're mourning, is because they hadn't been preparing themselves. Matthew 24, verse 31, And he will send his angels with a great sound of trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other the other. But the good news, the great news is this. Those that have been preparing their hearts for Jesus to come, those who have been waiting, he'll take them home to give them eternal life forever. And that means no more sin, suffering, sorrow, or pain. They have made it. They endured to the end and have been saved. They made it. So that's the good news for them. So it depends on where you're at you're following the teachings of Jesus and, and uh, looking after his law, then it'll be good for you that he comes. For those that, who are ignoring and um, disobeying constantly, they will be mourning his coming. Isaiah 25 verse 9 says this about the righteous. And it, is, it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Notice what it says. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So the second coming will be a rejoicing and glad tidings for those who have been waiting and longing for Jesus to return. But notice what it says here. Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23. This is really important. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Whoa, okay. So if you read that carefully, it says, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. So this is not talking about atheists or non-believers in Christ. This is talking about believers, people who believe in Christ. They're calling him Lord. Notice what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, they're calling him Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So you can believe in Jesus and still be lost. Because belief is not just an acknowledgement, it's action. Belief is action. It's doing the will of the Father which is uh, obeying his law. Now, that can only be done not by your own power, but through the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. He will give you the ability to do that if you ask. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? So here are people that are prophesying. They're casting out demons. And they're doing many wonders in his name. So maybe like miracles of healing and stuff like that. But he will declare to them, it says, I never knew you. Depart from me. Again, he says, you who practice what? Lawlessness. So this lawlessness and obeying the law is really important. And many will say um, that it's not important. All you need to do is believe in Jesus. Well, that is not true, because believing is action. Uh, Obeying Jesus, following Jesus. And that 
is salvation, is through Jesus. And maybe many will say, well, that's works. Well, it works if you're trying to do it in your own strength. But if you surrender your heart to Jesus and allow him to work in you, to remake you into his image, then who's doing the work? It's Jesus. That's right. Now, I want to turn your attention. This is pretty fascinating because we're going to draw parallels between something that's already happened in the Old Testament um, to our day today, and that's the plagues of Egypt. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to summarize them, and, but I want, to, want you to notice something, and uh, this is really important. So turn with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 7, and you're going to look at the, the ten plagues of Egypt. And if you're not familiar with this story, I suggest that you do so. Basically, the gist of it is that the children of Israel, the Jews, or um, you could say the, the followers of um, the, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, they basically became slaves in Egypt. They were following God. They became slaves in Egypt for over 100 years. They were slaves, and because of being slaves, they kind of lost their religion to some extent. And so God was going to rescue them out of slavery from Egypt, from King Pharaoh, the the Pharaoh, and deliver him. And to do that, God brought plagues on Egypt through Moses, through Moses. So the first plague that um, God had on Egypt was turning their water to blood. Now, if you know anything about the geography of Egypt, you have the Nile River, which provides the source of life to their crops. And so Moses, by touching the surface of the water, turned it to blood. And Pharaoh, he didn't take any notice to it. It didn't, he um, ignored Moses. Well, the next plague that was brought upon the Egyptians was frogs. Now, this is kind of funny. God has a sense of humor here. So Egyptians, they worshiped multiple gods. They were polytheistic, which means they, poly means many, right? Theistic god. So many gods. They worshiped many gods. And one of them was the frog god. They, they respected frogs. Frogs were sacred. You've heard of like the term the sacred cow. Well, they believed in that as well. So they had sacred cows. They had sacred frogs. And so you never killed a frog. If you killed a frog, then you were probably killed yourself. That's how they treated frogs. And so God had multiplied the frogs in abundance in the land of Egypt, so much so that they were in all the houses, in the pantry. They were everywhere, so annoying that um, this really bothered Pharaoh that he pleaded with Moses to get rid of the frogs. And actually, this is what he pleaded. If you read the text, he says something like this. Please send the frogs back to the river. He didn't say kill the frogs because they were sacred, right? He sent them back. He said, please send them back to the river. But what did God do? Notice what the text says. Exodus 8, verse 15. Exodus 8, verse 15 says, But when Pharaoh saw that there was a relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. You know what God did? God did um, hear Pharaoh's plea for getting rid of the frogs, but instead of sending them back to the river, he killed them. And so there are frogs in heaps everywhere, and it stank really bad in all of Egypt. And God did this for a reason. He was showing them that their gods, the frog god, has no power, and it's not a sacred creature, though it is a creature of God. It's not a sacred creature. And so he killed them, and they had, to, had heaps of frogs all over Egypt. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, the frogs were gone, even, they were, even if they were dead, notice what he did. He hardened his heart, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. Now this is my point. This is really important. This is where we're going with this. And this is this. Just like the birth pangs, the earthquakes, the pestilences, um, the diseases, 
are going to get worse, but there's also going to be a lull of time where there are not any bad things happening, just like contractions. You have a contraction, then you don't, right? And so what, what this is a lesson for us right now living in this time that if we see these calamities happening, happening and we're scared and come to God and then there's a time of peace and prosperity and then we go back to our sinful ways. That's exactly what Pharaoh is doing here. Is as soon as the calamity was over, he hardened his heart and he does not heed the voice of God. Now, if you're wondering what the heart, harden the heart means, another word for heart um, in the Hebrew, because this is in the Old Testament, is your mind. Basically, he closed his mind off of, of surrendering to God. Then there was lice. Now, I've never experienced lice, but I've seen many, I've heard of many people having lice, and it's not a fun experience. You usually have to shave your head um, or do some uh, crazy treatment to get rid of it. And um, God caused lice in all the land of Egypt. And so here's the second lesson. As we go through these plagues, these 10 plagues, you're going to notice that they get worse, just like the birth pangs. They get closer together. They get worse, right? And then there's a law of time where there's nothing happening. And uh, after the lice, Pharaoh hardened his heart. I'm going to skip that one there. Then you have flies. Now, imagine, you know, flies are annoying, especially black flies, the biting ones, right? We're, we're, uh, we experience those in Michigan, and they hurt when they bite. These are black flies, biting flies. And so these aren't just flies buzzing around annoying you. These are flies that are biting you and hurting. And so God sends a swarm of flies in the land of Egypt to annoy the people because of their blasphemy. And this is what Pharaoh says. Exodus 8, verse 30. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and entered the Lord, and treated the Lord. Um, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses. So Pharaoh's pleading with God to get rid of the flies. And he does. He, he answers. So this is another lesson, is God listens to our pleas. He removed the storm of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Not one remained. So he took all the flies away, right? Because he pleaded with God. But after the calamity was removed, Verse 32, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. So you see a pattern here. Pharaoh, again, after their calamity is moved, hardened his heart. And what will we do once this calamity of the coronavirus is over? Are we going to be going back to our sinful ways, or are we going to go and worship God? Then we have a greater plague, disease on the livestock. So this is pretty crazy. What had happened here is that God caused many of the cattle to be destroyed. Um, and you can imagine that um, this, again, this would be like the sacred cows. So cows were considered sacred in Egypt. That's why... Um, the, uh, the Israelites, they were shepherds, and they were called an abomination because they um, shepherded the cows and things like that. And so they were considered sacred, these, these animals. Uh, and God killed them, again, showing that there's no power in the cow, and no God. Then he caused boils to appear. And uh, I don't have a picture of this because it's kind of gross. But um, if you can look it up for yourself online, just Google it. Boils. They're extremely painful uh, and disgusting looking. Pus coming out and stuff like that. And I'll just leave it there. And God had, had caused these boils to come on all the people, even Pharaoh himself. And Pharaoh still wouldn't repent and follow God. Now, God had already caused lots of the livestock to be destroyed. Then he causes hail 
and fire. And this isn't just like any hail. This is large hail. It says in the Bible that they had never seen any hail like this before. It was huge. Huge enough to destroy trees and crops and even animals. So I can imagine these hail balls were probably the size of suitcases or larger kind of thing to, to destroy animals and things like that. But um, this is, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one because here you see more of the mercy of God. Verse, Exodus 9, verses 18. It says, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause a very heavy hail to rain down. Such has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. So here you, it, God is not just sending a plague. He's giving them a time of preparation. He says to them, go and take your animals and shelter them. If you do that, they'll be fine. But if you leave them out in the field, they're going to die. Human uh, is going to die, and the animals are going to die, and the crops are going to die. And, uh, but he says, here, I'm giving you an opportunity to either you either believe me or you don't. And so those that believed God uh, sheltered their animals, but most of them didn't believe him, and they left their animals and workers out in the fields. And God brought the hail. And it says, He who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his, made his servants and livestock flee into the houses. So now you have a lot of the Egyptians who are, are seeing that God is being serious here are actually regarding here. But, but he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. And so this is a direct parable to us, parable, parallel excuse me, to us today that God's word is giving us instructions of what to do in the end of time. He's telling us how to be safe, how to have salvation, how to, how to endure. Are we listening to the word of God or are we ignoring and just going about our business? We're in the time of probation, the time before the great calamities come upon us. What will we choose? Verse 24, it says, So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail. So that's interesting. It's not just hail, but fire. So very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout all the land of Egypt. All that was in the field, both men and beast, the hail struck every herb of the field and every brook, every tree of the field. Only the land of Goshen, that's where the Israelites lived, where the children of Israel were, where there was no hail. So it struck everything. But again, you're going to see God's mercy here. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord that there may be no more mighty thunderings and hail, for it is enough. I will let you go and you shall stay no longer. So again, Pharaoh is pleading with God to stop the thundering, stop the hail, it's enough. This is the mercy here. Now the flax and the barley were struck, for, they, for the barley was in the head and the flax was in the bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not struck, for they were late crops. And so here you see that God did not destroy all the crops, he left the late crop. He wasn't trying to exterminate the people here. He was trying to teach them a lesson. And so he gave them more time. So Moses went out from the city, Pharaoh, and spread his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured on the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So you have Moses actually literally walking out in the midst of the hail and being divinely protected and causing it to stop. And as soon as the calamity stops, what does Pharaoh do? It says that he hardened his heart and he ceased not sinning. He and his servants, so his followers as well. 
and the calamity is getting worse. He yet continues to still ignore the word of God. So here's a lesson for you, those that are listening, is are you going to wait until things get worse and worse and worse, or why not respond now and have peace and assurance and gladness in your heart as things get worse, right? And what you're going to see is you, as you wait longer, it's going to be harder for you to make a decision because you're, you're ignoring God's pleading. And the more you ignore him, the more you're determined to ignore him. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as, he, as the Lord had spoken to Moses. All right. So remember now, God had left the spelt and the wheat, right? He didn't destroy all the crops. And so, again, the people did not listen to God, right? They were still sinning. And so then he sends the locust. And uh, you should, you should uh, watch a YouTube video of this, of uh, swarms of locusts. It's basically uh, a black cloud or a green cloud, depending on what, what color they are, but usually they're black. Black cloud of grasshopper, and they eat everything. And because there, there are so many, they destroy everything because they're eating it. And it says that um, the Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God, against you. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away uh, this death only. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. So the locust had eaten the spelt and the wheat and whatever was left over that wasn't destroyed by the hail. And now he's saying, please take this death only, because what are they going to do? They're out of crops now, right? And so he entreats the Lord. If you got the pattern down, what do you think is going to happen? And the Lord turned a very strong west wind, which took the locust away and blew them into the Red Sea. They, there remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go. Now, many people get confused about this text because it says, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. What does that mean? Does that mean that the Lord is making Pharaoh act this way? The answer is no, a resounding no, because that would go against that concept of free will, right? God doesn't take away our free will. What it's saying is that God, having the foreknowledge, he knows the future, right? He knows how people are going to respond, that... Um, he already knew that Pharaoh was not going to repent from this and that by sending the locust, he still wasn't going to repent. But it was a lesson for all the rest of the people and for people to come. Okay, now this is probably the most important one here, uh, the darkness. So God sends a, a darkness. I mean, this is not just darkness in the sense of we know it. This is pitch black you can't see your hand in front of your face. Uh, no candle or light can uh, give you any illumination. It's black. And so you can't see anything anywhere. Um, basically, imagine standing in a, a thick cloud of black in your face or putting on a blindfold, right? That, that's basically what it is. It's just black. And if you read in the Bible, it, so, it makes it sound like there's a, the blackness is like a pressure pushing on you. Why, why would God do this? What is the purpose of this black, um, you know, cloud that's around them? And it's actually pretty simple. It's actually twofold. One being, God is showing their blindness, right? They're blind to eternal things. Uh, they've been worshiping other gods. They're defying God. They're blind. And show, he's showing them their thick blindness. That's one thing. But the other thing is he's giving them a time to think, right? If you can't see anything, and if you have this oppression upon you, it gives you a lot of time to think. And that's what God wanted the, them to have, is time to think, time to examine their lives, and because what he was going to bring next was going to be his greatest plague because it was going to hit nearest to home, nearest to their heart. And that was the plague 
of the firstborn. So basically, the idea of this, God was going to send an angel of destruction to destroy all of the firstborn. So if you had two sons, or, or three, three sons, whatever the, whatever the firstborn was, God was going to kill them. How, no matter how old they were, they're going to be destroyed. But there was a solution. And that was if you took a lamb without blemish and you sacrificed the lamb and um, you took the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorposts of your house, when the angel came at midnight and saw that blood covering the house, he would pass over it and not destroy anybody. And it didn't matter uh, how many people had it in the house as long as they were inside the house. And they also had to do another thing. They had to eat bread without leaven. Bread without leaven. So yeast is the way we know it. Yeast causes bread to rise, right? It's a bunch of uh, bacteria or germs, as I understand it, that uh, causes the bread to expand. It gives it its expanding properties because the, the yeast is eating the sugars and, um, you know, multiplying kind of thing. So yeast in the Bible, or leaven, is a representation of sin. So they were to purge the sin out of their lives. They weren't had to eat the bread with the lemon, leaven, and they were to sacrifice the lamb, which represents Jesus Christ, of course, and take the blood and cover their, ho- uh, cover their doorpost with it, and basically representing that you're covered by the blood of the lamb. Christ's righteousness is covering you. So therefore, the destroying angel would pass over. In our own right, we have no righteousness of ourselves, but if we're covered by the blood of the lamb, then we, the, God will look at us as though Jesus, as we are Jesus, perfect and sinless. So let's look at this. Exodus 12, verse 12 says, For I will have passed through the land of Egypt that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute my judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be as a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be, be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So, and the plague did happen. Pharaoh didn't heed the lesson, and a lot of the, a lot of the Egyptians didn't heed the lesson, and a lot of their children died that night. And a Pharaoh's son, who was supposed to take over, died that night. And God said to uh, Moses, he said, if you read the, the chapter, he says that Pharaoh will now let you go. He'll let you go, right? But it's also something pretty neat that happened here. Many of the Egyptians, they believed God, and so they asked their Hebrew neighbors, the Israelites, can I come into your house and find shelter? For I fear, the God, fear God and know that he's going to send his angel. And they did. And so many of the Egyptians were saved because they came into the same house. And that means that salvation is for everybody. God gives opportunity to everyone. No matter what you've done in your past, no matter how bad you've been, he gives you an opportunity to repent and come to him and find salvation. And he will cover you, cover your, your disgusting unrighteousness with his perfect righteousness. So, Revelation 7, verse 1, because this is not over for us, right? It says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of earth, holding back the four winds of earth, so that no one wind would blow on the earth, or the sea, or any tree. So let me explain this a little bit. And I can go into this greater detail next sermon. But you got to understand, this is really important, and I'll get into this more, that God is not the only one who brings these plagues. A lot of times, it's Satan and his angels, as I'll discuss in the next message. 
and God is holding back the four winds of strife. Basically, if you can picture this in your mind, God is holding back, he's binding Satan and his angels from doing terrible things on this earth. Not that he, he hasn't have, uh, you know, sway over people and can do bad things now, but he can do really bad things. And God is holding back the four winds. But as we continue to ignore God, God is releasing his grip on Satan to do his work that he enjoys doing. That's destroying people. So I'll get into that more next sermon. But here's the hope. Romans 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Again, you can believe in Jesus Christ and still not be saved because you're still walking according to the flesh. You're doing your own thing. Uh, you're not following God. Um, God wants people who follow in action, and you can only do that by surrendering your heart to Christ and allowing his Spirit to do the work in you. Isaiah 4, verse 3 to 4, And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, that's us, and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her mists by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Uh, There's another way to put it, trials and tribulations. Right? God gives us the, allows us to go through these so that we um, basically grasp onto him and hold onto him, plead with him uh, for help and encouragement. Then the Lord will create above every dwelling place a, of Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day and the shining of a flaming by night. Now this is a, a reference to the children of Israel how when God delivered them out of Egypt, at nighttime, there was a flaming fire that went before them to keep them warm and to light their path. And in the hot desert sun, there was a thick cloud that provided great shade for them that went before them. And it says, God will be your covering. For, for over all the glory, there will be a covering. There will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime from the heat for a, for a place of refuge and for a shelter from the storm and rain. So where is the safest place to be Uh, when you're going through these calamities? It's not some bunker in New Zealand. It's in Jesus Christ and his righteousness. That is the best shelter we can be in because he will take care of us. Psalm 57, verse 1. Be merciful to me, O God, Be merciful to me. This is not some simple prayer. This is pleading with God. Be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you, and in your shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed. He who endures to the end, what's it say? Shall be saved, period. Shall be. It's promised. It's guaranteed. We shall be saved. These calamities will pass. And when they do, there'll be great joy and great rejoicing that Jesus Christ has come back and take us home where there's going to be no more sin, suffering, sorrow, pain, crying. It'll all be bliss. Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, Therefore he is able to save to the uttermost, those who come to God in him, through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So again, you might be thinking, but I've done so many terrible things. God can never forgive me. Not true. It says, therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to him. All you need to do is come to him. How do you do that? Come to him through prayer. It's not some elaborate thing you have to go through. Just call out his name pray unto him, ask for forgiveness, ask for a new life, and help to obey him. Do you think he's going to do that? Absolutely. So our next topic for next week is the seven last plagues. So we talked about the ten plagues of Egypt. Now we'll talk about next week the seven last plagues. Why are they the last plagues? Because there's no more after them. 
the end of the world will be here, and Jesus will come back. So let's talk about that next time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share your word. And I just pray that you continue to use me to bless your people, but also convict me of sin, transform my life and those people that are listening, Lord, that, we might, that you might give us the strength to endure, you might give us the encouragement. May we not be self-centered, look, just looking out for ourselves, but may we look out for other people. There's all, a lot of people that are scared because of this coronavirus, and there's a lot of people that are frightened. Let us be an encouragement and help to them, is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to give online, just Google Gladwin SDA Church, and you'll see this link pop up, and you'll see our images over here. And you click on the link, and it will take you to our homepage. And to give online, you go to this tab here. It says Online Giving. It's as simple as filling out your information, tithe, local church, and you can just type in numbers that you want, and it'll automatically give the total down here. Then you hit continue. If you already have an account, you can log in. If you don't, you can register, so you can, can give online in the future. Or if you just want to give this one time, you can create a guest account. You fill in your name and information, and then you continue to the next step, which would be three, which would be entering in your credit card, debit card, or you can give using a check. If you're planning on giving cash, you can't do that online. You got to use the self-addressed envelope and make sure you give it, you put my name on it. I mean, the treasurer's name on it instead and uh, follow the prompts from there. It's as simple as that. Hit the submit button once you get to step four and you just paid your tithe and offering online. God bless. No internet, no problem. Just take your tithe envelope, write your name on it, write your address and date, make sure you give your 10% tithe, give to combined budget, give to map, give to world budget, and anything else you want to give to. Write your total, make out your check, put it in the envelope, Here's the address for our treasurer. Pop in the mailbox. You just paid your tithe and offering. Have a great day. God bless.